everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to look at an introduction to web accessibility and education. What is accessibility and how does it affect us, especially here in higher education? And what can we do to ensure our compliance with accessibility principles? So we're going to look at what is accessibility. The internet was originally designed as an independent platform to be a universal system of sharing information, irrespective of disability. But we're seeing since the development of the internet that the proprietary technologies that are introduced, as well as the failure to implement World Wide Web Consortium standards, has led to these essential principles being undermined. And the World Wide Web Consortium is known as W3C. And we're going to talk more about the presence of W3C on the internet a little bit later. But we want to look first and foremost at what is web accessibility. Wikipedia defines accessibility as the design of products, devices, services, or environments so as to be usable by people with disabilities. And so the goal of web accessibility is then to provide people, in our case, students, with the opportunity to access the information and features found on the internet and especially in our courses. So accessibility is an important aspect of our course development and our teaching process because it provides all of our students equal access and opportunities within our classes. And there are various types of disabilities for which a student might need some sort of accessibility accommodations in our courses. And although there are lots of subcategories, we'll review the main categories that we want to address specifically within our classrooms. And that would be visual, so students with blindness, low vision, or colorblindness, as well as hearing. So that would be students with deafness or students who are hard of hearing. Motor skills could be, there's a wide gamut. It could be the inability to use a mouse, or it could be slow response time, or it could be limited fine motor skills. And then there's the cognitive aspects. So we're looking at students with learning disabilities or students with distractibility or an inability to remember large amounts of information or to be able to focus on information. So those are the main principles. Most of the subcategories fall into one of these main domains. So let's go back to the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. They have an initiative called the Web Accessibility Initiative, or WHY. They introduced this initiative and with it associated guidelines for content browsers and authoring tools. In education, we don't really develop our internet browsers. We just use a browser and your exposure to and utilization of authoring tools might also be limited. But we do have some opportunities. If you're using something like Padlet or ThingLink, Nearpod, or one of these other platforms, even PowerPoint would be a web authoring tool if you're using PowerPoint online. We also have guidelines for the content that we create, which is what we see in our Canvas courses. So despite this web accessibility initiative, awareness has been, it's really remained low in terms of accessible principles, and they're rarely followed in practice. More and more we're seeing them followed in practice, mainly I think because of litigation and public relations, but we still have a long ways to go. So the W3C has a website for this initiative. This website has accessibility principles and they're you know pretty detailed. It's a good guideline for people who are developing content on the internet, even if it's just in Canvas. So I'm going to focus on those principles that really we should pay attention to in higher education. And so the first one is we need to provide text alternatives for non-text content. So anytime you use a picture, a graphic, a diagram, then we need to provide those text alternatives, the alt text. And if it's simply a decorative image, then that's perfectly fine. We can have banners, we can have content in our Canvas courses that are purely aesthetic, but we just need to indicate as such and mark it as decorative so that people who have low vision or blindness or need a screen reader, it's indicated that this is content that's purely decorative. Otherwise, we need to write out those text alternatives. We use a caption, our video, and it's easier than ever using Studio. We have access to Canvas Studio to generate captions for our videos and for our audio. So we need to accommodate people who can't hear the audio or see the video and that they might need alternatives. So the alternatives could be text transcriptions and captions for audio, as well as even audio descriptions for video. And then we want to um, be mindful of our content using headings, section headings, properly using lists and tables, 
And this is for students who might need to change the presentation of the content in the course, such as if they're using a screen reader, this content needs to be well organized and we need to use these tools. We also need to distinguish the content so that it's easier to see and to hear. One way is using color. So if you use color, you never want to use it in a way that it conveys information, you know, for identifying content, for symbolism, for example. You wouldn't say everything in crimson means one thing, and if you see something that's in green, it means another thing, because some people can't distinguish between red and green. And so you don't want to apply symbolism or meaning specifically to a color. That should be identified through the content and not through colors. Color combinations are fine. You don't need to have a course that's just black text on white background or the opposite. You can mix and match colors if you want, but you just need to make sure that it's distinguishable and that it provides sufficient contrast. And you also wanna be mindful that sometimes the students, they have to bump up the percentage of the text. They have to zoom in on the page and sometimes even up to 400% or they might change the character spacing. And so you want to make sure that you're designing your Canvas pages in a way that no information is lost if the students have to resize the text, even up to 400%. Something that's a little bit challenging that I've come across a lot in, as I review materials and courses from our instructors is that you want to avoid having images that have text in them. And there are many different reasons. For one, you want to ensure that the image is high fidelity. And sometimes if it's not, then it can be hard to read the text. Also, some of our students use mobile devices, small screens on their phones to access our Canvas content using the mobile app. And so on those small screens, if there's text on an image, then it might be too small for them to be able to read. And it's just generally a good practice. If you're using an image, a photo, anything, you just don't want there to be text on there. You maybe put a caption under it or include the text written as opposed to in a picture. And that can be hard. If it's something like a picture of a roadway and there's a stop sign and it says stop, people know the symbol for a stop sign. And so that's not really the same as narrative text. And also, if you have video or audio, you want to make sure that students can pause, they can stop, they can adjust the volume of those things. And we use Canvas Studio, and so it's very easy. It has a player that they can speed up, slow down, they can pause, they can scroll forward and backwards, they can rewind if they need to. And so all those things are very important. You also want to make sure that students can easily navigate and find the content on the pages. So you want to make sure that everything is well organized. And this can be that your pages have clear titles, you have sections on your page, you use headings. You want students to be informed about their current location in your Canvas course related to the other pages in Canvas. So if they're on a discussion page, they should easily know how to get back out to the modules or they should know what's next. They shouldn't be lost in your Canvas course. Canvas itself makes it pretty easy with all of the navigation. You just want to make sure that there's a flow to the navigation of your Canvas course. Also, that there's a level of consistency. That doesn't mean that every single course has to look like every single other course. We want some individuality. We want some aesthetic. But we also don't want students to have to rediscover where things are in the course because your course is so much different than the other course that they're taking. And a final thing about this concept of being easy to navigate that we can adhere to as professors is if you have a hyperlink in your course, um, anywhere in your course, it should be very obvious where that hyperlink goes. Sometimes it'll go outside of Canvas, sometimes it'll go within Canvas, but it shouldn't be any mystery if they click on the hyperlink where it's going to take them. If you have a video that has text on it, you want to make sure that students have enough time to read and incorporate and interpret that content. You also want to make sure that you don't ever use content that might cause seizures or might lead to physical reactions. And some of that is being mindful of the content you curate because you might not create every video that's in your course. You might use other people's videos. So you just want to make sure that they're screened and that the content is appropriate and it wouldn't cause seizures. There are other considerations on this initiative. I don't cover every one of their principles, but just so that you're mindful, using Canvas is also a benefit because there are other considerations that Canvas incorporates, such as Canvas has a functionality that people can navigate through the course using a keyboard. You don't need a mouse. That's important for screen reader navigation. Some people can't use a mouse at all, so they are dependent on keyboards to navigate. 
Canvas helps us in that the content can appear and operate in predictable ways. They have previous and next buttons at the bottom of the screen. There's a global navigation on the far left in Canvas. There's a course navigation. In our part, as we're developing courses, as we're teaching courses, we can help out these strengths in Canvas by creating consistent page layouts. So these are various principles to consider in terms of the W3C initiative. So let's talk specifically now about web accessibility in education. Accessibility in education is a very important concept because it really allows students with disabilities to access and interact with our course content, regardless of their conditions. So a course that's designed around aspects of accessibility will allow students to actively participate in the course activities and access all of the information that they need to excel, which is our main goal. We want them to demonstrate mastery of the core competencies, and we want to give them all the tools that they can in order to do that. Often the accessibility standards dictate a redundancy in content modalities and approaches. For example, to increase student engagement in a course, a professor may create a webcam video or a screencast video for the students, and that's fantastic. But if a student has a hearing impairment or is a non-native English speaker, then audio recordings may need to be supplemented. So ideally with both subtitles or captions and transcripts, any imagery or videos that are important to the instruction should also be supplemented with comprehensive descriptions and alt text. If you do a podcast for your students, then you want to transcribe those for students that have hearing impairments. As you're designing your courses, I said this before, headers can help you organize the content for any students who use screen readers. I want to ask you this question. Why worry about web accessibility? Why is web accessibility a concern for you personally? Why should your dean or department chair be concerned about accessibility? Why is it important for the chief academic officer or the VP of academic affairs to be concerned with accessibility? Or how is this important to the field of higher education in general? Web accessibility, especially in higher education, is important because it provides all the students access to the online course content, which is important, but it can be overlooked. You know, sometimes we're so concerned about curriculum alignment that we forget that not every student might have equal access to things. So obviously that's important. Also, I think it's important to be able to understand video lectures and some faculty might speak quickly and some people might speak with an accent. Some, sometimes it's just hard to understand. And so an accessible video is great. And many students, many people just view videos these days with captions on. Even if it's YouTube or if you're watching Hulu or, or Netflix, a lot of people are turning on the, the captions and watching the videos that way. Also, you want to get for your students the ability to complete their assessments, the ability that they know what to do, how to do it, that they have all the tools that they need in order to do what they need to do in the class. And also you want them to have access to all of these resources. Some students have older equipment. That's an issue too. We can't just design keeping in mind that everybody has the most state of the art. Some students don't have state of the art things. Some students use personal digital assistants, PDAs, screen readers, or even wireless devices like small screens. And we can't just design thinking that everybody is viewing this on a projector or a large monitor. So there are various different screen sizes. Um, unfortunately, there's a climate, I don't know if it's unfortunate or fortunate, but there's a climate where there's a lot of litigation going out there. There are a lot of litigators who are just looking for any kind of inaccessible content so that they can take it to court. And that's holding us accountable as an industry and for good and for bad, but we want to avoid litigation whenever possible. So accessibility, good design can help us with that. We, not just our institution, but you know, our industry, we want to espouse a culture of diversity and inclusion. And we have to consider things like wellness in the classroom, integrative health and compassion. Compassion as teachers, compassion as learners. I'll mention that accessible design is good design. So if you're designing with accessibility in mind, it's not just a benefit to students who need accommodations, but it's also just really good design from an instructional design standpoint and from a web design standpoint and even a graphic design and UX UI standpoint, if you're designing with accessibility in mind, it's more likely to be a good design. What are some of the resources that we have? W3.org, that's the World Wide Web Consortium. And this specifically is the Y page that I was showing you earlier. So that's a great resource to review. 
webaim.org, I think is probably my favorite accessibility site. The page that I have here is specifically their contrast checker. And that's where you can find two different colors, a foreground color and a background color. And you can determine the ratio, the, the contrast ratio for those two colors. A contrast of one to one would be white text on a white background or black text on a black background. A contrast ratio of 21 to one would be something like white on black or black on white. And 4.5 is that, that's what we aim for. Um, you do it is a fantastic tool that we have in Canvas in our instance of Canvas. And here's a website, howtocanvas.com that has an overview of the you do it platform. And that allows you to check your entire Canvas course and quickly resolve any issues of accessibility that you might come across. You can also do a search for browser extensions. I don't know what browser you're using, but Wave is one of the most reputable ones. I think it's the, the biggest extension and one of the older ones. It's made by WebAIM, which is a department at Utah State University. They have plugin extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And also, if you're developing in Canvas, Anytime you edit the page, you'll notice at the bottom of the page, at the bottom of the, the content, there's an icon and that's an accessibility icon and it'll run an accessibility checker. So it's gonna check for a lot of the main things that we covered today, that you have sections, that you're using headings, that you're, you have alt text, that there's enough contrasts, for example. If you're working in Microsoft, in any Microsoft platform, really Word, Excel, PowerPoint, especially check out their accessibility checkers as well. In PowerPoint, it would be under the review tab and far to the right, there's an icon that says check accessibility and you can go ahead and click on that and it'll run through all of your slides, make sure that there's enough contrast and make sure that you have alt text. So these are great tools for you as well. Thank you everybody for joining me today. If you haven't already, please punch that subscribe button and check out How to Canvas on social media. Happy accessible teaching and learning.